Batman Begins. If we're gonna, if we could, we could, because I'm a huge Nolan fan, um, and I do agree with you. Sometimes he has too much plot, uh, <laughs> uh, because sometimes you're just like, God, that hurt. I can't. I yeah. just blow something up, Chris. I can't think that hard right now. <laughs> I mean, Inception, you're just like, what's going? I don't know what's going on, but this is a fun ride. <laughs> yeah. But so Batman Begins, um, you know, he basically re- revamped the entire Batman myth. And he did it in a beautiful way. And a lot when I saw Batman Begins, I was like, well, this is the best superhero movie ever made. Then The Dark Knight showed up and it was like, oh, my God, this is just at a completely different level. Yeah. Then Batman uh, Dark Knight Rises shows up yeah. and arguably the weakest of the three. But yet I'll put it up against almost a lot of other superheroes. Right. So what made that film not work nearly as well as The Dark Knight? Um, one of the great questions, one of the all time great <laughs> questions. I, Cause it's I, good. I, it's good. I, oh, it's really good. It's, it's good. really good, but it's not as good as the other two. And it's not, it's not as good as he wanted it to be. Um, I, because it was, uh, I was, I'm such a fan of his and such a fan of the, the, you know, the, the two movies that came before it. Um, I did a breakdown of that film so on my website, trivia.com, mm-hmm. and where I talked about how could this go wrong? And in my opinion, first of all, it's because it is too ambitious. It's he tried, he basically he went into it saying, Okay, I've just done the dark night. He made the Godfather. <laughs> he was trying to make the Godfather too. He was in movies, right? Yeah. I've just done I've just done on that level. Sure. How do I top that? And in my opinion, in trying to top it, it was so ambitious. Um, it, 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 it's basically a, 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 an analysis of a revolution in a society. How do you, you know, in, in, in The Dark Knight, you have the problem of a savior, but the society is still pretty much where it's at. You know, Batman takes the hit, so that they won't rely too much on a savior Mm -hmm. and he'll, he'll be the bad guy. Um, so that we don't get into this superhero cult. Okay. But it's still basically the same society. Well, in the dark Knight rises, he's trying to say, okay, how do we actually create a greater society? This is the classic question of science fiction, but he's trying to do it in the crime fantasy combination of genres. Super hard to do. But if you look at it, there's a number of beats from the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and what, what, in the breakdown way of what I talk about is it, I always take it down to the, the, the basic structure. I mentioned in the beginning, when you get those seven steps, it's really hard to screw it up. And in my opinion, he put so much superstructure in terms of the ambitions of what he was trying to tell in that story, on a desire line, I could not handle it. And I think I talk about it in the breakdown, it's a bridge too far. He just and, was a little too ambitious, slightly. But he still, it, la- but he still landed in, in places that most filmmakers yeah. and screenwriters would kill to do. Yeah. yeah, but the problem is without an urgent desire line tracking the entire story, Right. Because you have a large chunk where, as I recall, I haven't seen it's it since it came out. It just, it just it basically, there, it, it, exactly. There's it no desire line. It sits there. There's no urgency at all. And when you don't have the, the spine at the base, the whole superstructure collapses, and it's just it's spinning its wheels. Or as you know, what they sometimes do is it's plot for plot sake. And, and that's where that big theme, that ambitious theme, without the process, <clears throat> excuse me, without the, the plot and the, the structure underneath it to drive it, then it becomes over the top, it becomes a little on the nose, and you don't get any story ur- urgency, you don't get any narrative drive, and so it gets really tiring. Yeah, and, and I, if I remember the movie correctly, there was a moment when basically when Batman's thrown into the into the pit with a broken back after he battled Bane, yeah. it the story just sits there for about 
20 to 25 minutes. Everyone's kind of walking around Gotham. He's yep. taken over. It's a yep. few weeks. The cops are trapped underneath the thing. <laughs> like it, it's, there's nothing, right. there's, there is no drive. And then it picks up again, but there That's is. exactly the point. It's one of the, because I, I couldn't remember that, but yeah. now. Broke, broke his pit. back. He's in the pit. He's in the pit. He's not doing anything. The movie is not doing anything. Right. And, and, and Bane isn't a bad villain. He's actually a, a very well written and good and obviously well performed villain. But um, and he has a very specific. They, and that's the one thing that all the villains actually had, even from Batman Begins. Yep. They all had very specific um, points of view. And yep. Bane, Bane had a similar idea that the Joker wanted, but it just his like he believes that this is going to happen and this is my thesis and I'm going to prove to you, right. Batman, that this is my thesis. Yeah. You know, um, well, now well, I, he, I, villains are really good at, at opponents. They're, they're really good at that. Um, because they know that's the trick to doing, driving the plot that they want to drive. Um, but, but also just in terms of character sense, um, one of the things I always push is, um, in fact, I, I make the case that even using the term villain, is a problem for a lot of writers. Because when we think of villain, we think of this very simplistic, evil character. Yeah, twisting the mustache, right? Yeah, and, and, and it's so important. I always try to push writers, make the main opponent as complex a character as your hero. Because that is going to give you benefits up and down the line, in, not in, just in terms of, of character, in terms of the emotion that the audience has for the story, and especially in terms of the plot, it's just it's just super important. Yeah, I mean, and if you look at someone like, um, you know, one of my favorite films of all time, I've spoken about many times in the show, uh, Shawshank. I mm -hmm. mean, the villain of the the warden, and the and the and the, he had like three major villains: the the prisoner, um, the the main the main um, guard. And the and the warden is the ultimate villain. I mean, I think that's why it's so satisfying when Andy yeah. finally breaks free, and yeah. then and then just screws everybody along the way. It was such a <laughs> brilliantly written yeah. story. I can't mean yeah, it. it. Really, is terrific. Really it, it, love that movie. Love that movie. Yeah, it is. It is. It's part of one of the most perfect scripts uh, I've ever read, and one of the most perfect films I've ever seen. But I also I would argue going back to Batman. That Batman Begins could be the Godfather, where Dark Knight's Godfather too. I could argue that. <laughs> yeah, you see, I, but, but but where I would disagree with you is on the Godfather ranking. Uh -huh. I'm, 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 I strongly like feel that you know that you, you look at these charts. Of yeah, yeah, who's the best? Trilogies, right? you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's got Godfather <laughs> near the top. Godfather two a little higher, and then Godfather three is way down there. I just saw that chart fly through Facebook. Right. There was like all the trilogies, and yeah. and yeah. Fair, but, to be fair, well, my the most contention is my contention is Godfather two is not the movie that Godfather one is. Why? Because every beat in Godfather two was first done in Godfather one. Right. Without it, yes. it's the foundation. It's the foundation, but but right. literally every single story beat throughout the plot is in Godfather one. The difference is that in Godfather 2, they get that cross-cut structure. Oh, and so yeah. you're comparing the gangsters. You're comparing the gangsters at the different generations. But but in terms of the, you know, my anatomy story, they do an extensive breakdown of the Godfather. Right. And right. it's just one of the most beautifully written. Yes, it's great direction and so on. But I, I look at it from the point of view of storytelling, of writing a screenplay. Mm -hmm. Coppola's and a master. It is yeah. at every level, from structure through dialogue, every level, never been done better. And in my opinion, um, and I also tend to give a little bit more credit, just as when, you know, like when they're assigning credit in a screenplay, the original writer to me is always gets, gets most of the credit. Because the work of creating all of those beats is much harder than it is to adjust them later and polish. Right. And polish. And so to me, even though the polish job on Godfather two was incredible, the, the, all of the beats are writing Godfather one. And, you know, it's interesting. I talk about it in the class that 
The Godfather 2 was affected. How he wrote Godfather 2 was affected by the response that Godfather 1 got. Because it didn't get the response he thought it would get. Yeah, he thought it was going to be fired every other day. <laughs> oh, that was before he even started, yes. And thought he was shooting it. Yeah. But, I, but I mean, in terms of the audience response to the ending of the story. Yeah. He, he, what he thought structurally that, that he and Mario Puzo had done is create a character who, even though he's become the new godfather, that morally he has become the devil. And the whole thing is structured to the connection with making the equation of Michael equals, or Godfather equals devil. And, and so he wanted to get something that's very difficult to pull off for a writer in any medium, which is a split ending for the character. Whereas on one level they have succeeded, succeeded tremendously, on the other level, internally, they have fallen and failed. And all he got was people saying he succeeded. Isn't it great that he blew away the, the five heads of the families mm -hmm. and, along with his brother-in-law and so on? Isn't that great? They didn't see the moral decline. And that heavily affected how he then wrote Godfather II to make Michael a much darker character and much more... Not somebody we're going to root for so much as somebody that we see that this is a guy who is becoming more and more corrupt. So, so basically, without Star Wars, there is no Empire Strikes Back as far yes. as it being that good. And without Batman Begins, arguably, there's no Dark Knight. Yep. You yep. need the first yep. in order to build, build upon. You can't come out the gate with Empire Strikes Back. It doesn't have the gravitas. No. Well, it's the same thing if you want to go back to Endgame. You can't have Avengers Endgame without the 10 years of films that's right that built up that's those right. characters to get and to that crescendo there in terms of to get a concluding film like that in a series mm -hmm. it's all based on what you did before yeah all the setup the setup work that they do in marvel movies oh. is amazing yeah. amazing What's... and that's why that you know cuz they you you got this bank of characters and they're great characters, they're great superhero characters, but it's obviously it's gonna be in how you have them interact. And, and really, there's, it's quite an interesting story challenge that they have at Marvel, which is, what do you do with superheroes? Because for the most part, they can't die. And, and we know there are exceptions to that, which I won't mention, but, mm -hmm. but the point is, if they're superheroes and they don't have any real physical jeopardy, you know, I'll always laugh at the fights in superhero mm -hmm. movies because, you know, one guy hits the other guy with a punch that knocks him through three buildings, but you know he just shakes his head like a cartoon and then gets up and goes back to the fight. It's like you know, very quickly you realize, hey, there's nothing's going to happen in this fight. Nobody's that's why Superman. That's why Superman's so difficult to get behind. Exactly, exactly. But but so the trick, the way Marvel handles it, is how they they interweave and interconnect all the films of the separate ones. So that when they get them all together in the, you know, the Avengers, right? The Avengers and all of the, all, you know, the, the, the two, the, the two sides that the villain team versus our right. hero team, where you're basically just t taking the heavyweight fight and you're kicking it up another 10 notches um, because you're getting one all-star team against another all-star team. It's all been set up, you know, years and years before with the other films. And that's where the payoff is so great. And so that's like that's what sports are. Like it's the Yankees yeah. versus the Yankees were always the great villains. If you don't live in New York, if you're in New York, they're the heroes. But the Yankees in the in the fifties and the forties and the fifties, they were they they were just dominating. And the Bulls yeah. were that in the nineties, and and LeBron James is that now, and and so on. So uh, it, there's oh there is that, but it takes time to build that. 